Well, now, as well, before we get ready to read God's Word, I want to hold a copy of God's Word in my hand. And I'm thinking about this book, thinking about the fact that the newest words in here are 2,000 years old. The oldest words in here are at least 3,500 years old. They have stood the test of time. They have led countless millions to an encounter with the God of the universe. They have provided the way for human flourishing, the forgiveness of sins, for the peacefulness that overcomes anxiety, for the hope of everlasting life. They have stood the test of time, and they will continue to stand the test of time. As someone once said, I didn't make this up. It is making me. God's Word is making us. It's the reality around which all others break. The truth is, as the wedding service says, the bond and covenant of marriage was established by God, by God in creation. That's where my understanding of marriage comes from. That's where our understanding as a group of elders and pastors comes from. Uh, that hasn't changed. Reality doesn't change based on what other people say. You can be confident that leading through these words will lead people to the life that is everlasting. So let's go to God in prayer as we get ready to read from his word. <clears throat> Gracious God, we have need of praying to you, for the world has been topsy-turvy this week. There has been violence. There's been the unraveling of much that is good and sustaining our culture for centuries. There's been confusion, and there is tumult. But you have spoken a true word, an applicable word, a powerful word, we pray that you would continue to do that now. Take those who are imprisoned and make them free. Take those who are bound and make them loose. Do the work that only your word can do. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I have a brief word. We're beginning uh, the study of the stories of Joseph over the next five or six weeks, and I would like to begin with one verse from Genesis 37 and then set up our guest speakers. So from Genesis 37... Verse 28, Midianite traders passed by, and the brothers drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit into which they had thrown him, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. So those traders took Joseph to Egypt. We're beginning the story of the grandson of the promise, who was a favored son of his father, but was betrayed and laid hands on by his brothers, sold to be a slave for decades. His life was seemingly wasted and lost, but God had a greater plan. Through years of imprisonment, God would create something in Joseph and through Joseph that would be essential to the redemption of the world in Jesus Christ. Being constrained by physical limitations, being constrained by personality, being constrained by bars, being constrained by finances, these are not insurmountable obstacles to our God. In fact, He sort of likes them because He can use things that we think will cause us to be of no effect to be of everlasting effect. Nearly 20 years ago, in one of the places that people would have considered the darkest in our land, prison in Angola, God brought Burl Cain to be warden with a vision to shine the light of God's word in the darkness. To use bars and incarceration as no obstacle to the freedom of living according to God's plan and finding forgiveness of sins and new life in Jesus Christ. Today, what's going on in Angola is a model not only for our country but for the world. You through our church, recently supported a project to bring Ugandan prison workers to Angola to understand how you run a prison by Christian principles to transform your society. What Warden Cain has done has rippled around the world. And today we're going to hear both from him and from a Malachi dad, one of the prisoners who's found life in Christ and is leading others to Christ as we celebrate a God who knows no bounds. Would you please welcome the Warden Burl Cain. Really honored to be with you all today, and uh, 
It's unique to come to church this Sunday here because we did bring Hayward Jones, one of our inmates, and uh, we're going to introduce him a little later. But first, I would like to pray. Father God, I just pray that the word we say today would be what you would have us say. And Father, we realize, but for your mercy and grace, we're unworthy to speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. I say that because uh, a little bit about myself. I never dreamed I would be a prison warden. I was afraid of Angola. My mother would threaten us, his children. We're going to send you to Angola if you don't do this and you don't do that. And we were really afraid of it. And one of our neighbors went to Angola for stealing cattle. And so we thought we'd never see him again. But anyway, uh, we did. But uh, I'm a school teacher. And so I'm just a little bit, do we have any school teachers here? Will you raise your hand, school teachers? Okay, you can run Angola, I promise you. <laughs> because uh, my career was short. I taught three months and uh, had a certificate. I'm an agriculture teacher, FFA. and. Uh, and so at the end of three months, I told the principal, I can't do this. I hate this job. This is horrible. I just can't these kids running me nuts. And I just, I just don't want to do this anymore. And he said, well, he said, let me tell you, if you break this contract, I'm going to see you never teach again. I said, good, I'm out of here. <laughs> and so that was the end of my teaching career. Anyway, those skills you learned to manage high school students is exactly what we did at Angola. But the other thing is, this was a job that I did not want and uh, was coerced into. And only after the first execution did I realize I needed to be there. And that's all another story, and I won't go into that today. But uh, let's talk about who is a criminal. It's real so simple, and we miss it. We have all these psychiatrists, and we study and study it. He's a selfish person. He has no morals. He doesn't care about your lawnmower. He doesn't care about your weed eater. Doesn't care about your car. If he wants it, he needs it. He sees it. He can sell it. He takes it. So he doesn't care about anything but himself. And so what is that? That's an immoral person. So if we can get someone to become moral and care and think it's better to give than to receive, then we can rehabilitate. So it's really pretty simple. So where do we find morality in our culture best? We find our morality best in religion. Moral people don't rape, pilfer, and steal, and moral people do. So that was pretty simple to figure that out. Now here's the other factor that's important. Corrections means to correct deviant behavior. It doesn't mean to torture and torment, lock and feed, and get even. Now here's why. There's already a victim. So we can get even with him for what he did and, get, and be mean to him, do whatever, and punish him for what he did. But that person is already a victim and we can't undo it. We really are supposed to focus on who will be the next victim, you and I that haven't been a victim yet. So therefore, to do our job properly, we need to get away from the torture and torment. Now they need to work and they need to, they need to do their thing. And they need to, we need to keep order but we need to focus that we don't have another victim. So it's about your safety, it's about our safety and our children's safety that we really need to focus on. So therefore this change element, this moral rehabilitation really and truly needs to occur in the prison. Now let's go back one step further. Why did it happen in the school? Why didn't it happen at home? Why did he have to go to prison and have a victim before we could change his life? And that's the part we're working on now. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This Malachi Dad program originated in Angola. There was a guy there from Awana. Anybody ever heard of Awana, those programs? Okay, that's Christian program for children. And he wanted to talk about this program, Malachi Dad. He said, I need two hours of your time. We got to talk. I said, man, look, I don't talk to anybody for two hours. I can make a decision way quicker than two hours. Just tell me the deal. In about two minutes, we had, I realized it was a good program. The way we went, that's what we did. And so we started the Malachi Dad program. Now it's in 14 states and I think three foreign countries all originated in Angola. And it's about children, inmates' children. And so uh, let's talk though about, about what we, I think we mess up in our school. What happens is, and my mom taught school 42 years. She had this saying. She said, the smart kids are gonna learn in spite of themselves. 
The ones you have to worry about are the kids who are underachievers, how to motivate them and how to get them to achieve and so that they can graduate as well. Well, she's right, really. So what we do in our schools is remember now, you can't get a job until you're 16 because of child labor laws. So about the eighth grade, what happens is, is a child, he's failing, he's making else, and he don't want to be a failure. He's embarrassed, he's humiliated, and so he drops out of school. Well, he can't get a job till he's 16. He has no dad normally, and so therefore he's in the streets, he starts stealing and robbing and so forth, and, and so then we lost him. There's victims that go to prison. So in prison, then we pick this up and we realize that we have to have the education program. The largest vocational school in Louisiana is at Angola with 450 vocational slots, skills and trades. We have K through 12 for about 900 to 1,000 students and uh, the inmates are the teachers because we have the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and so they produce students, graduates, just accredited just like LSU. So when budget cuts came and they, we lost our teachers, it was a blessing. We were glad because it forced us to use the inmate teachers that had never been done before because people say that won't work. You can't do that. One inmate can't have power over another. That's bull. That, all that is old traditional stuff that don't count in prison. The advantage for me was I never worked in the prison until I, till I was a warden of a prison. So I have no tradition in me. If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. If it makes sense, do it. So, uh, and I'm honored to, to mention Dr. Kleinpeter is here today and he worked with us in corrections for 10 years and it was a blessing to have him and work with him. And then Dr. Blunt and Suzanne's here and I see them back here and, and uh, they're our dentists to the oral surgeons. Saves us a lot of money. We don't have to carry them on trips. So I'm glad to see y'all today here with us. But uh, anyway, if it doesn't make sense, we don't do it. We're very non-traditional. Now the good news is the other states are doing what we do. The seminary changed our culture. It was a God thing. I'm going to read you one scripture. And uh, this is what happened to us at Angola. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There was inmates at Angola praying in a small church before we got there for deliverance. And so what you saw is this scripture came to fruitation at the penitentiary. Because today there's nine churches, there's inmates in the pulpit today preaching. He is, he's a member of a church and I'm gonna speed up so he can talk. He's a member and plays a role in the church. He's also a moral mentor and he works with young, young prisoners who come in. Now we have 6,325 prisoners at Angola. That's more people than there is in Tinsall Parish. That's more people than there is in New Roads. It's a lot of people. There's 1,500 employees. We used to have 1,800, but we do it with less now, which is cool because the culture in the prison changed and the people became peaceful. Okay, the other cool thing was the inmates came to me a few years ago and said, y'all are using too much profanity and you shouldn't be cursing. Your mother wouldn't like it. I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so therefore we start, we start with me. I stop cursing, but you have to too as well. So now you can walk in Angola and you'll have no profanity anywhere in the prison. No one curses. So who can boast that in any community? And we can go a weekend with these 6,000 people and not have a fist fight. And that's how peaceful it wretched down. Now certainly it's like fish, we're not gonna catch them all. And so we can't change them all, but we work on them. This is the program we're doing now. This is called the Onesimus Project. This project is that we have 1,000 short-term inmates that came in from Phelps. So we practice on them, the education, the skills and trades, and if we get it, release a guy from prison to go sweep the floor at Jerry Lane Chevrolet, he probably won't hire him. But if we release a guy from prison to go work at Jerry Lane Chevrolet with a patch on his shoulder that says, I'm a certified mechanic, he will hire him. He doesn't care because he's going to make the company money and so forth. So we have to graduate people and send people out of prison with skills and trade and good education so they're employable. Then they don't hurt you again. Back to the school, what I was saying. When they get to 12 years old, to, to, when they get about to the eighth grade, we really need to be focusing and, and fork the curriculum. We think everybody needs to be academic. Everybody can't be academic. There's more entrepreneurs in skills and trades than, than there is academics. 
the doctor has to have the plumber. What we should be working to do is, is split the curriculum because if you have things that, and you give tests like you do in the military, and that's what we do, we want to know what you like to do. And then we put you in doing what you like to do. And if it's tinkering with engines and being a mechanic, cool. If it's being a welder, be a welder. But have these programs where the, the child could go to school two hours in the morning and keep learning to read and write because he has to do that but he doesn't have to have the sophisticated academic classes because he's not going to college. He's going to skills and trades. Then he tinkers with his, with his welding machine and his torches and he strikes beads or he's either tinkering with a motor or he's tinkering and, and doing something he can succeed at and he's learning. And so then he would stay in school. Then when you graduate finally, there's no reason he can't walk down the aisle while one's getting a diploma over here to go on to LSU. He's getting a certificate and a diploma that says he's a certified welder with four certifications and he's ready to go to work with Bollinger and make $20, $25 an hour. Then he doesn't go to robbing and stealing to try to make it and then have to try to get the money to go to Votech school and continue on. He could do this in high school. It could be done. Now they say, okay, well, we can't afford it. Well, I'm saying you can't afford not to do it because what's the cost of crime? We dropped our population by 4,000 having these programs in the last two years because we now are placing people in jobs so you don't have, we don't have as many victims because it worked. So therefore, if it worked, how much money did we save? About $80 million we saved in cost of incarceration. So you switch the cost from incarceration to education. That's where it should be. Then we are less victims. We're not victimized as much. So it makes sense. It's just to get the, the people to understand it and move that direction. And that's what's so frustrating in our world. But anyway, needless to say, other states are doing what we do. Texas is doing it. Last weekend I was in Los Angeles. I met with Biola University at Los Angeles, Bible Institute of Los Angeles. They're gonna do the seminary in, in California. We're gonna start one in Michigan. We started it in, in, well, 10 states are doing what we do at Angola. I'm going to ask Hayward to come on up. Hayward, come on up. We're going to talk about what you do. A little more about Onesimus when he comes up. Onesimus' project is this. We feel like that these short-term inmates, we have an 18-month program that we intensely put them through, teaching them to be urban ministers. Okay? And it's, the program was written by the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Now, if we can get this urban minister to go back out into an urban church, and we can get the suburban church to pay his salary. You're one of the suburban churches, but a lot of them together could pay his salary in the urban church who may not have the money to pay him. We have all these inmate children in the urban area. Where did they come from? You know where they came from because 75, 80% of the inmates in the prison are black. But if we could get these ministers in the urban area with these children of inmates who are being mentored from Angola and from all the prisons in Louisiana, then we have a toehold to get in the community through these kids. We can get this urban minister from Angola to get them into the urban church and we'll start changing the culture in the community. And that's what I read here. We turn back to Jesus in the community. We can turn it around. We really feel like we can heal the community. We think we can do it from prison. We have set up the programs to do it, and we sent out our first urban minister to New Orleans last week. He was the pastor of my church. I go to church at Angola. I'm a Baptocostal. That's what it is at Angola. That's our religion. And so I don't go anywhere else other than like today. Anyway, this guy here, now he's committed a murder. Victims trump. We're not going to let anyone out of prison or anyone have any kind of break that someone has to be afraid of. If we can't reconcile with the victim, he's just out of luck because victims always have to win in our world because we cannot ever imagine the pain and suffering they've gone through. And if they're afraid, he don't need to ever leave. It's the way the mop flops, okay? And so, Hayward, I want you to tell what you do. One more thing about him. This is the only prisoner I know who has custody of his eight-year-old child who was in a, who, or is he still in the institute? You, you got him out. We sent Hayward to Monroe, and he may tell that story, to rescue his own child because inmates' children are seven times more apt to go to prison than other kids, and his would go into prison just like him, but he intervened and saved him. And we sent him Monroe to go up and save his kid and be his, and be his guardian. So you have it. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. This is my uh, distinguished 
same pleasure uh, to be here and it's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Haywood Jones. I am uh, serving a life sentence for second degree murder at Louisiana State Penitentiary. Uh, my life has uh, dramatically changed um, over the years. One of the things uh, that drove me to that was my, the compassion that I had for my kid. My, my child, I didn't know where he was for six and a half years. Long story short, when I did find out where he was, um, lo and behold, the Lord just allowed it to be like it is. I, I got custody of my kid when he was eight years old. Um, me and my oldest sister have full custody of my kid. That's where he lives. Um, he's, uh, he's a Christian. Uh, he's, he's a good man. Guy. He got in a little trouble. Warden Kane sent me up there to get him straight. Um, he's 19 now in his second year of college. Um, I'm also, um, I serve as the vice president of the Malachi Dad organization, which uh, a few of your members here, uh, Pastor Whitney, uh, Brother Hans, uh, Brother Locke, uh, Brother Bill, a couple of guys, they've been uh, with us through, um, we met them last year. They came, we had a big meeting, and they became a part of our Malachi Dad family. We just graduated 142 men uh, out of our Malachi Dads program um, last month. And the, the Malachi Dads was a, a ministry that we wanted to hold because the one true thing is most 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 people love their kids. They just don't know how to be dads. They don't know how to be fathers. <clears throat> but the, uh, our original theme was we wanted to reconcile uh, the dads back to their children. Malachi 4, 6 is our signet verse. And he shall, uh, he shall turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the ch their children back to their fathers. And ultimately, it's to raise up multi-generational faith. We want to institute biblical principles in our children's lives so that they can go and influence their children and their children after them. That is uh, our goal and our vision. We didn't know it was going to blow up this big, um, and, but God's blessed us tremendously through that. Uh, the reentry program, I'm also a lead social mentor. Uh, our job, we have about six parishes. They sentence guys to Angola to be mentored by men like myself. I work with a host of guys. They, we have to uh, teach them education. They have to get their GEDs. Uh, we teach them vocation, a vocational trade. We have actually 22 different vocational trades that they can obtain there. It's not uh, second class. They uh, go to off-site testing sites. They, you know, the guys really put in their work. Their instructors are mentors like myself, vocational guys who are master certified in their crafts. Um, these guys, when they come out, the one thing that you will have, you'll have a guy that knows how to work. Uh, you'll, my job is probably the hardest, their attitude, their behavior. Uh, we teach all the soft skills like anger management, victim awareness. We teach those guys how to be men, how to change their mindset, uh, play, get them going in the right direction. Um, we, we have to do progress reports. We have to you know, track their uh, progress from the time they get here morally uh, to the time they leave, and they're partnered with one of us. Um, between three and five guys are pers I'm personally, personally responsible for at all times. Um, we also uh, have, a, like, a, it, it's, a, it's a big project and it takes everybody to do it. Warden Kane gives us the opportunity to have the responsibility to lead, the responsibility to be men. It's our way of giving back to our communities that we've hurt so much, is to send a, a young man out there with a different mind frame. That way he's an asset to his community and not, not you know, a hindrance. He's not somebody that's looking and, you know, for another victim. We don't want any more victims. We're tired of prison as usual. And um, I'm just a, I'm a part of, I'm a product of what was already going on. I had my pastor in, in the church that I serve as the chairman of our deacon board. He challenged me as, as a man. He said, you need to stand, you wake up, man. You're, you're running around. You're, you're not being who you could be. You're, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your life. And um, he challenged me to become everything that, that I can become. And Warren Kane gives us those opportunities to, he'll either give you enough rope to hang yourself with or enough leeway to, to, to you know, be a positive influence and force. So I have committed and dedicated my life to doing the right thing no matter what happens in my life, whether I stay in prison or not. Um, I'm gonna make an impact on this world. And, and he is, you know, God has just been graceful through Warren Kane. One of the things that he, he didn't say was, um, you know, just to give you a mind, something in your mind, because I kind of know numbers. In 1995, when Warren Kane came, there were about 1,300 violent offenses a year in that prison. Today, speed up with losing over 300 staff members, with gaining a whole nother population of inmates from uh, Phelps due to budget cuts, another institution shut down. 
all those guys are with us now. Um, so we have another 1,000 plus guys there in the prison uh, added to Angola's population. And you know, last year, probably we had about 211 maybe per year. And the numbers keep going down. What is it? Um, Morgan Cain said it earlier, it's a God thing, but it's because men have stepped up to do what is right. Um, so um, that's just a little bit in a nutshell about me, um, about what I do in the prison. He didn't mention. He didn't mention that his pastor is a is a inmate serving a life sentence for murder. That's the pastor of his church. There's 28 pastors. There's no gangs in Angola, because they all belong to churches and groups like that. And uh, the way that the education department is funded is funded totally by the rodeo. All the profits from the rodeo by all the supplies and tools. And this, he's a moral mentor, so he gets 50 cents an hour for doing that. And uh, he's worried, and he does teach, he teaches anger management. So when you have a, a guy convicted of murder teaching another group anger management, it's pretty effective, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so he's really cool. But anyway, we went through this pretty fast and the party is we wanted to have questions and answers if anyone had any questions. So we have one over here for Judge Downey. Yes, we have the seminary at the women's prison, and we have a program called Hannah's Gift. And what Malachi Dad and Hannah does is it teaches them how to work with their children. If you go off to Iraq or the war, then you're still a dad. You still mentor your kids. They don't know how. So we have to have the social workers work with them to tell them how to answer the question when, when they get letters about dating and issues. We don't do it by the telephone. We do letters. In that way, then they have time to think about it and answer the question. And yes? You're supposed to mention funds for operations for the seminary. I know I was going to get there. <laughs> I was trying, I was laying a foundation. You just write to the point. That's because you're a judge. <laughs> you just tap the gavel. The point is, the seminary, the women do the same thing with Hannah's gift to teach them to be moms. And the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary also has a campus at the women's prison, and we were running short on funds. It takes about twenty. It takes about fifty thousand dollars a year to do the seminary. Ours is paid for at Angola. We raise the funds from all over the country, and we're good. Theirs was running about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars short. They didn't have enough, so. So we were going to put out a call if we, you know, kind of need some folks to adopt the women's prison and be sure that they meet that every year so the seminary can continue to exist so these programs can, can continue. Women are, you know, it's, it's hard. It's a little bit harder for them than it is for the men. But it's kind of out of sight and out of mind where Angola is right out here big and in your face. And we just finished our new seminary building, 11,000 square feet for $300,000. So we got the donation from a chicken farmer in, in Arkansas. So that was cool. <laughs> I'm glad the chickens are doing well. Yes, sir. How many volunteers does David need to come up on Monday nights to spend time with Malachi Day? Hey, well, you better answer that. I don't have a clue. Uh, the, well, uh, we, did, we did have about five or six of the guys that came uh, all year. And we do have your certificates, too. We got a little something for y'all special when you get back uh, home. But we would uh, embrace, um, you know, maybe 10 at the most because we got we have a big group of guys that are going to be uh, participating in Malachi Dads. We would hope that you would uh, get involved uh, here in the program because it's very beneficial wherever you are. Um, I, I appreciate you guys for coming. Y'all are always welcome. Um, but 10, 15, you know, you can we'll probably could use a few more because he's only talking one prison and there's five of us. So, you know, we can spread out to other prisons. Absolutely. So whatever's available, we'd utilize. And another thing is there is there's no uh, there's no budget for our reentry program. Our reentry program is paid for by our um, rodeo fund and alongside with our reentry club organization. And what they do is they generate money throughout the year to help pay for offset cost of the guys' testing fees, their uniforms they wear, supplies, equipment that they may need. So no taxpayers' dollars is going into this. It's all inmates, you know, yeah. putting forth the work. I actually serve uh, in the capacity of vice president for that organization. We, and we generate, we've generated, since we've started, 
uh, in five years, we've uh, put, put back over $100,000 back into the program uh, in, in a give back uh, situation. So God has, it, it is a very uh, give, give. That's what our guys do. That's what, you know, the heart of do, Angola really. Do we have another question or we have a close in here? I want to just give a quick testimony to uh, this young man right here on my right. Um, about a year and a half ago, we took six church members up there, and we spent the weekend just kind of learning about Angola. And then after that weekend retreat, we spent about six or seven months, and Hans came up to me last year and just said, hey, why don't we commit to Monday nights? And Monday night's not an easy night to get all the way up there and back by 10 o'clock, but we, for the most part, went two-thirds of the time during the course of the year. And when you show up there, you would think, well, is it intense or is it scary? No, it's not at all. Matter of fact, once they get to know you, they let you in. You go all the way to the seminary room where all the guys are, and then you get in your family groups. So the first time I went, I was in a family. This is my pastor. Hayward is my pastor when I'm in family group four, and there's six of us. And so we just mix in with the groups, and they're going to study the Word of God. And as they're studying, they're going to ask us questions. They're going to ask us, what do we think as well? We join in. And then sometimes Hayward will call on me to, to lead sometimes, sometimes to pray. But I also go to be refreshed. And in, some of you out there are thinking, well, could I really do that? If you're interested after this service, come up here and talk to Hans. He is our lead guy on this. Hans has been the most faithful over the past year. He's been there literally. Even when times I couldn't go, he would try to go himself. So I know we would love to have more participation. Burl, I'd like to pray for both of you and the continuation of what God has been doing, not only for the past 20 years, but what he's going to do for the next you know, 150, however long until he returns. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for both these men and the many volunteers throughout this nation. Their lives have touched not just this congregation, but thousands of congregations. I thank you for Bob and Hans working so diligently, Lord God, to just bring those Ugandan prison officials last month for them to see what's going on through a program such as Malachi Dad, such as New Orleans Seminary and what they're doing there. We pray that the world would be transformed, Father. There's needs like this all over the world. I know we're in the Dominican Republic. I know they're moving to other places. I pray that you would open the doors of all 50 states, that every single state would be willing to allow this mission to change the culture of every prison. And we know, Father, the harvest, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. So we're just asking that you would provide, not just for this mission, for all the things that are out there. And we just pray, Lord God, that you would put a stirring in everyone's heart to be involved in something. Protect these men. Give them strength in all that they say and do. In Jesus' precious name, and the congregation said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much for having us. Thank you, brother. I love you. Love you too. Thank you.